Imagine your beloved grandmother being one of the many victims of the first ever serial killer caught in Mexico. What's going on, you guys? My name is Layla. And I'm RJ. And we're the hosts here at Haunting Mysteries, Inc., where we cover everything from serial killers to unsolved cases and everything and anything that has to do with true crime. That's right. And today, Layla will be going over a serial killer from Mexico that I have never heard of. Yes. And I'm very excited for this episode because it gave me the idea to do a series with RJ of serial killers we've never heard of because there's so many. So if you're interested in that type of series, make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, and let us know that you want that type of series from us. Right, and now let's just get into it. Let's do it. Patricia Payan, a criminologist at the time that this case was unfolding, had a close relationship with the forensic doctor assigned to the victims. Every time a new victim was brought in, she would go in to investigate what she believed was the cause of death since she also had a diploma in forensic medicine and was a bit of a curious person. On September 2003, Patricia noticed the lifeless body of an elderly woman who was brought in that still had the cord around her neck from being strangled. A week later, another lifeless elderly woman was brought in with the exact same cause of death, strangulation. A week after that, another victim, same age, same MO, was brought in. For those who don't know what an M.O. is, M.O. in the criminal world comes from the Latin phrase modus operandi, which means mode of operating, and it refers to an identifying characteristic or behavioral pattern that we use to identify somebody through the way they commit a crime. At this point, all of the victims Patricia, the criminologist, had witnessed and studied were from the Benito Juarez area, which is described as a borough in Mexico City. However, a month later, another victim would be discovered the exact same way, but this time the victim was from Cuyacan, Mexico, which is about a 15 to 20 minute drive from Benito Juarez, meaning the killer began to expand to different towns and areas. Patricia, the criminologist, began to put together that this was the doing of a serial killer. When she brought this up, however, she was completely shrugged off. She stated in a documentary that they essentially told her, stop watching so many TV shows and exaggerate it. This could be for two reasons. The first one could be because she was a woman, and it is a recognized problem that women aren't taken as seriously in these types of fields of work in Mexico. And the second reason could be that Mexico hadn't had a serial killer since 1942. And even that case is debated on whether it was even a serial killer or a spree killer. And that was the case of Goyo Cardenas. Some of y'all might be wondering what the difference between the two are, and according to my connection in the FBI, shout out to Monique, the difference between a spree murder and a serial murder is the lack of a cooling off period between each killing. To further identify the difference between the two, a killing spree is typically a short period of time driven by intense emotions or of desire for attention. And in the other hand, a serial killer plans and intentionally commits a series of murders over an extended period, following specific patterns, which is the MO we referred to earlier. Some psychological aspects of the crime do come into play, but that could also be its own episode. That's wild because I would have assumed that a serial killer and a spree killer were the same things. I didn't know there was two different uh, ver like versions of a killer. I thought they were all just a serial killer and that was it. Yeah, I... Also, I never really put thought into it. So when originally I was doing research research on this case and they mentioned that, I was like, interesting. So I did my own research and then I wanted to validate it with Monique and she validated the information that I found. It's good having her on our side. A hundred percent. And it's funny too that you said that because she was a woman, right? And you told me that certain countries, especially like South American countries. I'm going to get to that. Okay. But you're, you're, you're on the right track. Okay. But I will discuss that later on. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Now, Patricia, the criminologist, plays a huge part in this case. Instead of getting discouraged when her prediction of a serial killer was shut down completely, she got to work. She was able to backtrack all the way to 1996 and 1997 to the first violent robberies with a similar MO of an elderly woman who was strangled after being robbed. Patricia wasn't the only one putting the pieces together, not at all. In fact, the media was 
all over this unfolding case. Newspaper companies began speaking to each other regarding what was happening, and they began applying pressure to the authorities by asking them public questions about the case, as well as publishing articles with titles like, quote, serial killing of old women, and murder of nine old ladies is being tracked, quote. There were many more, but those were two of the most popular type of titles that they had going around. Got it. It became very apparent that the district didn't want to share or make any of the information they had public. I, I hate that so much because I really feel like if they would at least make it public, I, I get you don't want to cause a mass hysteria, but people not knowing what's going on, just it drives me nuts how that's like the way that they operate. It drives me nuts. It's interesting that you say that because my next line says, lawyer Bernardo Batis stated they didn't want to spark outrage or appear in scandalous headlines which in my opinion kind of backfired if you ask me because they were already in scandalous headlines. Finally, after much pushback, the city government was forced to acknowledge that there was indeed a serial killer and the district attorney's office of the federal district finally formed a special group intended to locate and catch the killer. If you watch Criminal Minds when they huddle in their office and discuss a case, it was a similar situation to that. In fact, this episode was in an episode of Criminal Minds but their information obviously was based off of, mm -hmm. not the exact information. It makes sense. Some of the people assigned to this group were crime scene experts. However, there was a huge problem. A lot of the victims' families would clean up the crime scene once their loved ones were taken because they couldn't stand to see the mess and where their loved one passed away, which was understandable, but a huge issue for the investigation. How are they supposed to find out who did it if they're messing with the evidence? Again, lack of knowledge, right? This meant that any evidence such as DNA, clothing, fingerprints, crime scene reconstruction, and forensic analysis such as blood splatter patterns were all thrown out the window. Of course. Due to the lack of the relationship between the victims and the murderer, the only motive detectives could find for the killings was the robberies that occurred after. But that didn't give them much to go off of, and with lack of evidence, it's a bit of a hard time trying to find out who's doing the crimes. Detectives began researching convicted serial killers from different countries, such as Richard Ramirez, Jeffrey Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, and Eileen Wernos, to try to get a better understanding of how they operated and help aid in their investigation. They also reached out to professionals in France because of their experience with serial killer Thierry, Thierry, Poulon, Thierry Poulon, it's French, I'm so sorry, who was a serial killer of old ladies as well, a case I will be covering very soon, so don't forget to follow and subscribe so you don't miss it. Here comes another French name, Philippe Dussou, my apologies if I mispronounce that, which I know I did, whose title is Inspector Brigada Criminal de Paris, was flown to Mexico to give a course on serial killers. I'm sharing this to show how difficult this investigation became for the Mexican police when they had nothing of knowledge of dealing with these type of killers. Because of these conflicting descriptions, the killer was dubbed El Mata Viejitas, meaning the old lady killer. But when you put the word El in front of it, it refers to it being masculine, meaning they thought it was a man committing these crimes. Other news outlets referred to the killer as La Mata Viejitas, meaning the same thing, but with a feminine connotation, meaning they believed it was a woman committing the crimes. So very conflicting, right? Remember this for later, because it's going to come into play. The whole description of all of it sounds so confusing. Because again, it's not just a man. It could possibly be a woman. But the whole big hand thing, right? I'm, initially, I feel like if you think of big hands, you think of a man having big hands. But again, it, it, there's just the, the spectrum that they're creating for who it could possibly be. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, and that's all based off of witnesses, correct? You know, so that's why it was this case gets so hard to track down, okay? Yeah, totally. Another description they kept receiving was that the criminal would dress in a nurse's or social worker's outfit. This was common at the time in Mexico because the governor of Mexico at the time created a financial support program for the elderly. So, of course, anyone who showed up to these elderly people's homes offering to help them be enrolled in this program were going to be welcomed with nothing but open arms. No background checks, nothing? 
No, because they would come in with their social worker outfits or they were coming in with their nurse's outfit and certain IDs. Got it. So it gained the trust of the victims. Right. You wouldn't be suspecting anything. You're like, oh, you're here to help. Exactly. This, of course, led the authorities to investigate healthcare workers as well as nurses, because duh, which resulted in the arrest of Matilde Sanchez Gilegos on January 9th, 2004. Matilde was arrested because the composite drawing or the police sketch looked identical to her. And for those who are listening to the audio format, all the photos will be posted on our IG at Haunting Mysteries Inc., as well as our video format here on YouTube, which will be linked in the description. Detectives were confident they had arrested the correct person, so they made a press announcement claiming so. However, people who knew Matilde believed the detectives were searching for an escape goat and purposely releasing sketches that looked like her. When they put Matilde in a one-way mirror room to be identified by witnesses, Matilde was never picked. People who loved her began protesting for her release and after 15 hours, she was released with zero charges. Detectives claimed in a following press conference that they had fingerprints from some of the crime scenes that were not destroyed, but when they compared them to Matilde's, they were not a match, so they apologized for the unfortunate arrest. Detectives continued on with their investigation and learned that the suspect would study their victims by knocking on their door with the false promise of the benefit program, and once inside, would talk to the potential victims, seeing what they owned, how they lived, before deciding to kill them or leave them. It's just so smart to do that. It is, unfortunately. And, and it's like, again, older people, they're not going to be suspecting of anything because who would want to harm an older person, right? Yeah. And again, it's just, it's so smart. It's annoying how smart that is. I agree. If the victim was chosen, the killer would, of course, then take a scarf, phone cord, or a home item that was lying around and strangle the victim to death. They would then rob them and take a souvenir as well. Taking a souvenir is considered as a pathological behavior, which symbolizes power and control, or at times as a form of taunting law enforcement or the victims of loved ones. It's like a sick game that they play. Yeah, I could totally see that. The media was getting more and more intense at this point because around 11 to 14 victims had been found that year alone. There was not a single news outlet you could turn on at the time that wasn't talking about the Mata Viejitas. As the authorities began to understand the MO of the killer, they began to make statements telling the elderly people to stop opening the door to strangers, to not walk alone, and to lock their doors. People wanted this killer caught. Older people in the Mexican culture are loved and respected, even within the criminals. They don't mess with the elderly. Yeah, I, again, they say, you know, you should respect your elders and everything like that. So I just, I would never understand trying to harm somebody, especially someone who's so vulnerable. And, you know, I love my Oma and everything too. So I just, that's a sick, a very sick individual to mess with someone who can't defend themselves. And, you know, I just, I'm not, I really don't like whoever this is. Yeah, I mean, it shows, to me, it shows a sign of weakness on their part that they have. It's kind of like when adults pick on kids or anything Same like thing, that. Same thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that same type of evil. It's the opposite ends of the spectrum. Correct. They're 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 but both still. innocent and, and and vulnerable, and it's like leave them alone. Correct. Well, leave everyone alone. Yeah, leave everyone alone, but especially but yes, them. I agree. Finally, after a long time of searching, there was a break in the case. Victim Gloria and Edina Rizo Ramirez, who was 81 years old, was found deceased in their home. The fingerprints of a woman named Araceli Vasquez Garcia were allegedly discovered on a glass at the crime scene and was later arrested. Araceli was found in possession of a similar, if not the same, watch that the victim Maria owned, again, allegedly. It was later discovered that she owned a wig, a white nurse's coat, and some cards from the National Institute of Old Age that were issued to some elderly women. Again, allegedly. Why is everything allegedly? We're gonna discuss that later. Okay. So keep that in mind. Quick side note that grossed me out was when the suspect that was being shown to the public with what looks like to be behind a clear glass, the news reporters and the paparazzi were heard laughing at the fact that the suspect who was arrested was a woman and they were whistling at her and just being a bunch of weirdos. And the whistling was like 
that cat calling whistling. Yeah, they were hauling at her and stuff like that. Because they were basically taking Araceli and they were making her wear a wig and the lab coat and all these different things, like really implementing her to the public, okay? Mm -hmm. Like selling the whole image. And this is really important when I get to this later. Got it. Now, Araceli took full responsibility for the robberies, but denied ever being involved in any of the murders. Despite her claims of innocence, they still sent her to prison. Araceli got charged with five to 16 murders and was sentenced to 42 years in prison in 2004. Finally, the public thought that there would be peace again. However, that feeling didn't last long. Why? Because the body of 92-year-old Delfina Gonzalez Castillo was found deceased in her home just a few months later. In 2004 alone, 14 victims were attacked and killed, and as the years progressed, more victims were dying more rapidly. So, so they were being robbed as well as being choked? Yes, yeah, so strangulation and robbing was the MO. Okay, so that's weird. Especially, and as well as elderly women and the whole nurse's social All the worker same. outfit. All the same MO. All of it. Every single one exactly the same. Okay. This begged the question, was Araceli the actual killer? Things got even more complicated when yet another suspect was arrested for the crimes. Jorge Mario Tablas Silva, who was arrested for committing two of the crimes and later more, was also found, quote unquote, with a white coat and a wig and pretending to be a nurse. Again, alleged information fed to us by the detectives and the press. Okay? Keep that in mind too. In a press conference, it was revealed that Jorge's first crime was allegedly in 1998 against an elderly lady that gave him a place to stay. The victim was Maria Amparo Gonzalez Salceda, who was also killed by strangulation, but this was never proven. And there was no terms of allegedly used in these press, press conferences. They were just like, this is the facts. This is they're being arrested and they're sentenced to prison. As far as I'm concerned, I, I can't really trust anything when it comes to what is allegedly or any, it just sounds like everything's just not. No, allegedly is what I'm saying because I'm getting to a point. Okay, because so far it just makes me feel like whoever's involved, the officers or whoever's doing this just is not trustworthy. You're on the right track. We're going to we're going to get further into that. According to detectives, they believed they had a bunch of copycat killers, but none that could be linked with substantial evidence to the crime scenes. Even in the case of Araceli Vasquez, there had been statements that contradict what was stated about the evidence. There have been a few sources who have stated that Araceli's fingerprints were not found at the crime scene and that the items found on her were not those that belonged to one of the victims. And said people believed that much like Jorge, the third suspect, they were caught for robberies but charged with murders to close a case detectives were struggling with. We all know that for some sick reason, people come forward and confess to crimes they didn't commit for attention. And there's also the cases of bad cops and bad detectives who will force a confession or pin cases on victims that are also victims because they're being forced to go to prison for things they didn't commit for political reasons and political pressure. And then of course, there's the last resort, which is they actually did it. But in this case, there's no evidence actually pointing at them. And isn't isn't that the whole like idea of a court and, and to be proved like to be innocent till proven guilty? Correct. And if you can't prove anything in court, how are you going to put someone's life away for not having solid evidence? Well, agreed. However, that's when we go into the fact that you know you and I always say there's a lot of great cops, a lot of great detectives. We know them. True. But then this is the evilest of the evilest side where when they do have that type of power and there is political um, pressure and there's a, an election going on and, and all these different things and they want to try to make someone look good or they want themselves to not have the pressures as cops from the society, mm -hmm. they're going to do what they can to shut it and close it. Yeah, which is, again, it's just horrible because these people, people are not numbers. Like these are literal people that have families, that have their own lives and, and then it gets stripped from them because yeah. – they're the wrong person. I mean, they're the, at the wrong place, the wrong time. Yeah. So it's ridiculous. Just, just hold your horses. Watch this. Despite these arrests, the crimes continued to happen, which put even more media pressure on the police department, as well as social and again, political pressure. So much so that the people were urging for the removal of district attorney. 
The district attorney represents the government in criminal cases and is responsible for ensuring that justice is served by prosecuting individuals accused of committing crimes. But clearly the public didn't feel like that job was being done well or at all. Between 1998 to 2005, there was at least 49 cases with a similar MO recorded in Mexico City, 49 elderly women who were robbed and strangled to death, 49 families who lost their grandmother. At this point, the investigation was about to take yet another turn. Remember when we talked about how the suspect was described as both a man and a woman by different witnesses? Mm -hmm. Well, that led detectives to believe that the suspect was male, but would dress himself as a woman, which could have been a possibility. Could have. However, their approach was terrible. They did believe there was a slight possibility that the suspect was a masculine woman, but they doubted that because of the strength that it would take to fulfill those type of strangulations. Some girls are very strong, case in point. Yes. I don't think I could fulfill a strangulation, but, you know, when there's enough anger fed into me, maybe. Hey, I'm telling you, you're a whole different beast. Maybe. But still, believable, right? I, I can believe it. I can yeah. 100% believe it. This was the point where the police began arresting any SEX worker that cross-dressed. Some of the SEX workers stated that they were tear gassed once inside the car and also stated they had no choice but to go with the cops. It was described as a raid, which refers to a sudden and forceful entry or attack by law enforcement authorities on a location where criminal activities are suspected to be taking place. This experience, as described by them, was awful. According to their statements, they were mistreated, their rights were stripped, and they were ambushed into providing their fingerprints and DNA, which is unacceptable and terrible. Now, the SEX workers claim that 80 to 120 of them were arrested and booked. However, Guillermo Stayas, who was a homicide prosecutor at the time of this case, claims no bookings took place. Just because they were SEX workers that cross-dressed, that put them in the pool? Yep. That's the stupid, that is so dumb. Yeah. And that's how they felt. That's so, that's so, uh, this is, this is a stupid case. Honestly, though, from my personal knowledge of El Salvador, and for people who don't know that, I was living there until I was six years old, grew up there. A lot of Latin countries aren't welcoming to the LGBTQ community. So it's not hard for me to believe that Mexico is going to be any different to El Salvador. And so I'm pulling more towards believing the uh, cross-dressing SEX workers. Quick side note, I never want to offend anyone. So if any of the terms that I used were offensive or incorrect, please do correct me and let me know. And if that is the case, I apologize in advance. Also, if I censor certain words, it's because I don't want to get flagged. So it's, I don't want to be incorrect. So just please let me know. I'm willing to learn. I mean, no offense. Nothing came out of the ambush towards the case. They were all innocent and not involved at all with the Mata Vijitas, no DNA, nothing. Now, remember Patricia, the criminologist we discussed in the beginning of this episode? Well, she advised the forensic services to create a 3D model of the suspect by description, and they said, no, that we only use that to identify bone remains. So Patricia, once again, was like, fine, I'll do it myself. She used the 120 to 125 composite sketches that she had on hand to create the 3D statue out of a styrofoam base and commercial commercial plasticine, which melts, by the way, in heat. So she had to keep this face model in her fridge. And every time her children went to grab something from the fridge, they were like, what is this? Like, get it out. That's dedication, though. I, I respect her hustle for that. She then took that 3D model that she created and talked to the witnesses, showed them the model and made altercations according to their statements and slowly but surely developed a model that looked identical to the actual killer from every angle. So whatever side they saw them from could be identified. And I like this girl. Yeah. Patricia, the criminologist, began creating a geographical profile by pinpointing on the map the spots where the homicides took place, and she used different colored thumbtacks for every year that passed by for all of those murders. Since it's known that the most serial killers don't kill near their homes or workplace, they believe that the suspect used the subways around the areas to get to the victim's towns. They also noticed that the killer always attacked homes that were connected to main roads that allowed for a quick escape route, all thanks to the map that Patricia created. 
Detectives began distributing the composite sketches to surrounding police stations. They increased patrol in the areas that were being attacked, and they had patrol officers just driving around multiple streets with their sirens on, sending the message that they were serious and they were looking for this perpetrator. On January 25th, 2006, the killer entered the home of 84-year-old Ana Maria de los Reyes Alfaro by asking for a glass of water. Once inside, the killer took a stethoscope and strangled Ana Maria to death. What the killer wasn't expecting was that one of Ana's friends slash tenants, Joel Lopez, came home at the time that he did. The killer made eye contact with Joel and walked out. Joel followed her outside and yelled for help with sorrow in his heart after seeing Ana Maria deceased on the floor. Thankfully, at the time, there were patrol officers coming around the corner when they heard Joel's cries for help. They rushed to catch the killer and managed to grab them just before she made it to the subway station to make a getaway. So it's in fact a girl? It is. The right killer was finally caught and her name was Juana Barraza Samperio, who was a 49-year-old woman. Juana was found with two supermarket bags on her, which contained voter ID cards from the elderly, food bank ID cards for seniors, several wrestler business cards, which I will get to in a little bit, blood pressure monitor, jewelry, and a keychain that stated the title, quote, La Dama de Silencio, quote, meaning the Lady of Silence, professional wrestling champion. Her demeanor in the cop car was very calm. In fact, she took out a sandwich and began to eat it. So who is Juana Barraza Samperio? And what led her to committing these awful crimes? Juana was born in 1956 in rural Hidalgo, Mexico, just north of Mexico City. Her mother was an SEX worker who soon after having Juana left the father who was a corrupt policeman. Juana's past is awful. As a child, she was very quiet and to herself in school, which resulted in her having issues at school, so much so that she never learned how to read or write anything but her name. When Juana was 11 years old, her mother sold her to an old, old man in exchange for three beers. You mean sold her as in like SEX stuff? Yeah. He, SEX abused her and she suffered miscarriages at the age of 13 and 16 and soon got pregnant with her first out of four children she would have. Again, her mother sold her for beer to an old, old man, okay? So I know that people have this conception where they did awful things, but I think that two, two things can be truth at once you can find them to be an awful person for the crimes they committed, but you can also sympathize for what they went through as a child that caused a psychological disorder that caused them to act like this. Yeah, because in no way, shape, or form, right, are we agreeing that the way that she handled what happened to her, like, let's say that this is the reason why, right? Let's say this is the reason why she's so aggressive and, and hurting and killing people, and, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, my God, dude. Yeah, like, never excuse their behavior, but still acknowledge that, Jesus Christ, what that... 11 thinking of her as 11 year old who hadn't committed the crimes yet that's terrible okay yeah like re regardless if it was for a beer or for even like like for millions of dollars like regardless it's it's messed up like that that's that's a wild yeah sad. um but man miss that's not easy on your body either no. like this yeah it's poor thing you know especially yeah. when she was a kid good night yeah soon after her mother died juana moved to mexico city where she proceeded to have the remaining three children from multiple failed marriages Unfortunately, Juana's eldest son died at the age of 24 when he was beaten to death by muggers. Juana resented her mother and blamed a lot of her misfortunes on her life, on her mother, which many people believe was the force that led her in choosing elderly women as her victims. During the 1980s and 1990s, Juana toured Mexico while taking part in a form of wrestling known as lucha libre, meaning free fighting, anyone who has or ever been a fan of um, Jack Black. Yeah, Nacho well, Libre. Nacho Libre. The wrestlers in this style typically wear masks and have cartoon-like nicknames, mm -hmm. typically fighting as either Tecnicos, good guys who fought by the rules, or Rudos, villains who broke them. 
Most of the time, Juana spent her time in the front rows establishing the arenas, selling popcorn, and organizing wrestling events for small town parties. She would occasionally partake in the wrestling. However, she was in the low rankings, so she would only make about 300 to 500 pesos, which is about 20 to $33 in American dollars. <laughs> this is when she got into shoplifting to support her children, according to her. In 1996, Juana and her friend began dressing up as nurses together to gain the trust of elderly women and would rob them. They wouldn't kill them, supposedly, but they would rob them. This backfired when her accomplice and her friend's partner demanded 12,000 pesos as a bribe to not arrest her since he was a corrupt cop. By the way, that's about 700 US dollars back then. Insane amount of money. Like if she had that money, she wouldn't have to be robbing. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. In 2000, Juana retired from the ring due to back injuries, which only worsened her financial situation. This was around the time that a rise in brutal murders against the elderly began. Now, there is speculation that because she was injured and could no longer wrestle, she had nothing to take out that anger and frustration towards her mother on. True. Kind of like when we go to the gym and we get a release. And they believe that maybe this also added to her like anger that just added up when she couldn't work out anymore. Oh yeah, for sure. And plus it's elderly women, just like, you know, her mom was older. You yeah. Know, so it all makes sense. During an interrogation, Juana stated the murder of her last victim, Ana Maria, was the only one. And she was caused by anger over money. She claimed that this was the only murder she had ever committed. The detectives informed Juana, however, that they had her fingerprints linking her to at least 11 murders, to which her response was, quote unquote, I'm not denying it. Yeah. They proceeded to ask her why she did it, and she shared the story of her abusive mother in tears and claimed that this is why she hates old ladies. She went on to say, quote, it's no excuse and I don't deserve to be forgiven by God or anybody. I did it, quote. While she was waiting in the prosecutor's waiting room, she was asked to demonstrate how she strangled these women. So one of the detectives took off his tie and handed it to her to have her demonstrate it on him. She began to show them and at one point got a little too excited and began squeezing it a little too tight. The Capitol Police got together with Joel Lopez, the man who helped Juana get caught after walking in on his lifeless friend to see how they could reward him and he was publicly deemed a hero and was given an award. The arresting officers were awarded 100,000 pesos, which is about 6,000 US dollars in an apartment, as well as being rewarded as heroes by the community. So insane. In my opinion, I believe Joel deserves that more than them, sorry, because he was brave enough to chase after her despite being devastated and yelled for help. And if it weren't for him doing so, and he, he would have been frozen, she would have just walked into the subway and the cops would have never even known. So Joel got nothing. No, he got recognized as a hero. Despite being seen as a hero, Joel states crying in an interview and you can see the pain in his eyes that he would have rather rescued her, which of course, but it, this man, when you watch him talk, God, it breaks your heart. Juana's co-wrestlers described her as calm, loving, and like a pan de dulce, a sweetheart. They claimed she constantly had loads of money and constantly dyed her hair, and they found that strange. But besides that, there weren't any red flags about her that led them to believe that she would be responsible for such horrible crimes. I mean, some of these friends would have them over with their mothers, you know, and she never attacked them. She was loving. Juana was charged with 11 to 17 murders and 12 robberies and was sentenced to a whopping 759 years and 17 days of prison. Political justice in their eyes. I'm sorry, it was just funny that, you know, it was a 700 or something years and then 17 days. Yeah. Like, I yeah. just, the 17 days is just funny to me. More murder charges were attempted to be added, but they couldn't be proven. Juana attempted to be found not guilty by reason of insanity, but that obviously was not accepted. Remember Araceli Vasquez, who was arrested as the Mata Vejitas in 2004? Well, she remains in prison with no proven homicides or even evidence pointing to homicides connected to her. In an interview, she stated that she was guilty of the robberies, but that was it, and everything else was pinned on her. In tears, 
this woman was saying, I just want to be known as innocent. I, I'm not doing anything. Like I didn't do anything. And she said that she would run to the guards in tears being like more women have been killed. It's not me. Like, please let me go. And they would just ignore her. Okay. Witnesses even came forward stating she was not the person they saw. Mind you, Araceli is a short, tiny thing, nowhere near the description given of Juana. In the documentary on Netflix titled The Lady of the Silence, The Mata Viejita Murders, a few of the authority figures were asked why Araceli wasn't released when Juana was captured. They had all the DNA evidence against Juana and they responded, I don't remember her or I assume for other charges, which pissed me off, bro. At 57, she appears older than she ever has. Her son was killed in a robbery, so she never got to say goodbye to him because she was in jail or prison. Her ex-husband has moved on with his own life and her daughter now lives far away. She's literally all alone in prison, serving a sentence that there's no evidence for, dude. None. When you saw me doing my research and I was crying, this is why. Then there's another arrested suspect, Mario Tablas, who was convicted of murders of the Mata Vejitas as well. And just like Araceli, there are no fingerprints or substantial evidence linking him to those crimes either. In fact, one of the cases he was charged with was later discovered to have DNA evidence belonging to Juana. And they still left the charge and didn't blame Juana for it. And he sadly died in prison claiming his innocence. So I beg you all, literally, I beg you, I was crying so freaking much in this. If anyone you know can help me find a way to do anything to help Araceli, because she she has no lawyer, people won't take her case because they're scared of the political issues that will, will they'll be faced if that case gets opened again. Okay, so please, if anyone has any idea how we can help Araceli, email me at truecrimelayla at gmail.com. I will have my email link down below so you know the correct spelling. I need to know if there's anything I can try. I, I did my research. I can't find anything that I can do. Or at the very least, guys, if y'all can please share these episodes with anyone you know who, might can, who, who, who can help, let me know, please, because maybe if it gets to the right people, God willing, like something can happen, you know? I don't like, I'm going to pray about it because I, bro, she's in there. Meanwhile, get this and it pisses me off. Juana is serving her life sentence like a celebrity in prison with special privileges. She gets to cook every Tuesday and sell her food to make money. They call her Don Juana, which is the essential of being like, hey, ma'am, in Spanish. Okay. People move out of her way when she comes. On top of that, people have made movies about her and funny songs about her and merchandise of her in her wrestling outfit for socks and t-shirts because it's quote unquote funny and entertaining because she was this big woman who did wrestling and then killed elderly women. One of the victims family members in the documentary goes, what about the victims? If y'all have time, I highly suggest watching the documentary I stated earlier, which I will also be linking in the descriptions of both the YouTube and the audio format, because you get to see the victim's loved ones speaking on this case. They have very impactful things to say, and I think it comes across best when they say it. For sure. And for all the victims stated, I will be posting a slide on the video format or posting a photo on our podcast Instagram well, for with all of their names and memory of the victims and photos that I can find as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much all I have to cover in that case. I know I got hella excited and excited. I mean, as in like aggravated towards the end, but that's because I was doing the research like Araceli, like, oh God, bro, when you see her clips of her talking, she's in tears, bro. She, she's like five foot, bro five foot tiny hands that's the one that they humiliated and made her wear a wig and 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 people were like cat calling and whistling and and mocking her that's her like i understand she did robberies i get it but bro she's in there for 42 years she's served 19 years already and and this killer's been caught for for years living it up in jail living it up as the big boss in prison yeah so I'm making money so, so I've been quiet for a while, but I've been kind of festering. Um, so first and foremost, just, you know, when, when Layla 
when she asked y'all to help out and, uh, you know, it, we, we want views, right? It's, that goes without saying. But Layla genuinely cares about these people. She's done this many a times when she was on her TikTok by herself. And she literally will go out of her way to contact people and try to figure things out to try to get any type of closure or, or, or vindication or anything that she can do for these people. So she genuinely cares and she really means it. So if you guys could do that, that'd be amazing because like Layla just said, she's been in there for 17 years, 19 years. 19 years. And please, 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 like, listen, if if my podcast isn't enough to get to you, watch the documentary. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Skip through the whole thing. There's English, like they, they do a voiceover in English. There's subtitles in English. Skip to the whole thing. At the very last 10 minutes, you will see Araceli talking and she's literally in freaking tears, bro. Like, watch that and tell me that like, you can't, like, you can't help. Like, I, I just, I just fucks me up. I just, I just, I just don't know what to say because when you said that the evidence proves that it was her and you said that the, the lady that's in there right now has, is small in stature. She's tiny, bro. You know what I mean? Like, so, tiny. so all that, it's like, just because somebody's about to get the reputation messed up because they called it wrong. Like, I think there's a special place in hell for people like that. Like, just because you don't kill people or, or essay people or do anything no, like that. No, no, like, no. And, like, even their reactions, their reactions, was like, oh, I don't remember her. But but that's what I'm saying. That 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 right there does not, her. that does not forgive you for making a mistake. No, because you're still taking a life. You're taking a life. And someone is, someone is literally going through hell right now while you're at home within your, probably, a, I would say, a decent house. You know what I'm saying? And your family living your lives. When, when, when you have the power and the capability to free them for something that they were never, they never done. It's like, dude, they've already put so much time in, in, in not having a life. They, they, they missed out on so many things for dude, something they didn't do. It makes even, no sense. I'm not a fan of the Kardashians, but I even, I even look to see how I could, I don't even know how to reach out. Like I try to find a way to reach out to her because she takes cases where people are wrongly convicted and she does it for free to like give rep representation. So even for that, like I tried to like, re I, I couldn't Dude, That'd be so awesome though. If, if, if there was a way that she did get free though, whether, whether or not, you know, we had any part of it, you know dude, what I'm I saying? I don't care. I just want her to be free. No, that's She's what I'm just saying. sitting there, bro. In, the, in a, in a prison full of killers. Ridiculous. And her son died while she was in prison. And then the other guy died while he was in prison too, for something that he didn't do either. He died claiming his innocence. It's a, it's a, it's just so stupid how people that have this much power they shouldn't even have this much power. But then again, they just do whatever they want. And there's no repercussions. It's and bullshit. You, know, you and I always I stated this earlier. You and I always say like there's lots of great detectives. There's a lot of a lot of FBI agents. There's a lot no, there of great is. cops. And there is, but these dudes like these are the people. It's like when they're bad, they're horrible. They're scum. They're the worst. They're low lives. Yeah, they don't deserve to breathe. Um, and it, it, one of the things I was going to ask you, I was like, man, what happened to these people that, you know, were wrongly convicted? Because again, like I would just common sense to me, if, 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 if there was someone that literally had all the evidence pointing towards them and they were literally found that it was them, they'd be out. Well, like that, the people was, that, were, that was my goal for this case. It's, it's obviously like a case based off in Mexico. So a lot of people don't like watching documentaries in different languages. So mm -hmm. I'm like, what if. And, and then I looked at this case on like YouTube. I looked at this case on a lot of different things. And most of the coverage of this case has a lot of views when the case is told in Spanish. Okay. And there's not a lot of people covering it in English. So then I'm like, what if, what if at all, what if all the takes for Araceli to get freed is more eyes from different countries? Well, especially because maybe, you know, like the people that don't want to help her out in Mexico are, are, like you said, scared of like the political or anything, like anybody coming after them. What about somebody that's not that's tied to saying. Mexico? Like, you know, just some random person. It's like, yo, I'm going to step up for you and let's, let's get you Dude, out of like, there. Even if you're doing this for selfish, not you, even if anyone can hear me and they're doing it for selfish reasons because this is a high profile case and you want the attention. Get it. I don't care, dude. Just yeah. like, just reach out to me. That would be honestly, yeah, I don't, yeah, I could care less what your intentions are. That that woman does not deserve to be there. And if there's anything that anyone can do, like Layla said, regardless of like what your purpose is, at the end of the day, that lady getting out is what what matters. And I could I can care less. Kind of off topic though. So I when you were talking, I was I was thinking about. So you know how you said that her mother, the guy, the actual killer, Juana. Yeah, her mother actually died. Yeah. 
uh, you didn't say, you know, how the mother died. They didn't disclose that. But I was like thinking, like, what if that was? Oh no, I'm sorry. They did disclose that she oh. had some type of like liver issue. I thought I was like ahead of the curve. I was like, what if she was the one that did it? No, 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 no. She had a liver issue. And it makes sense though too that you know she was strangling these women, uh, and she used to be a, a, in a wrestler, Libre. Yeah. So it's like it it just all coincides. It makes so much sense that it was her, and it's. It's ridiculous how these people that, you know, didn't do nothing. I, I, I get it. Like, why you're so upset about it. Yeah. Anyway, I guess we can just wrap this episode up. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Thank you so much for spending yet another episode of Hunting Mysteries, Inc. with us. If you want more cases of victims and killers you've never heard of uh, in regards to the serial killer episode, make sure to give us your feedback by liking, commenting, subscribing, etc. We're still trying to gauge what type of content y'all do like, and that does help us. And don't forget that every Thursday we upload a new episode and he will be releasing a, another episode on Thursday, like I just said, duh. And the case that he discussed, from what I know, is extremely tragic and I would love to remind people of that victim as well. Yeah, I, I look forward to going over that case and again, thank y'all for being here and we look forward to seeing y'all next Thursday. We'll see you then. Peace. Bye.